database schema plus XML configuration plus Java object is greater than one. So what you can do is decide on a canonical representation, a single representation, and then generate the others. And I'll show you a quick example of this. I was on a project where we had this scenario. We were using the uh, IBATIS open source OR mapper. And for IBATIS, it's just an OR mapper. It's not also a metadata mapper, which means that you have to tell it the SQL to use, but then it will give you back an object graph. The problem we had on this project is that we didn't control the database. Somebody else did. A bunch of system uh, database administrators controlled that. And they were constantly making small changes to their schema that would break our code. It would be very subtle changes so that our code would just mysteriously fail and we'd spend an hour trying to track down why it's failing and then somebody would say, oh, maybe the schema changed. And sure enough, that was the case a bunch of times. So it was driving us crazy. So we decided to canonicalize this. Because the problem here is, where's the information? It's split across three different things, and none of them actually has a complete view of the world. What we really wanted was this. Since we didn't own the database, we said, OK, we'll let that be the official representation of this, of this data, and then we'll generate the other two things. And so that's what we did. The target that we wanted to generate for the, the configuration file looks like this. This is what an IBATIS configuration file looks like, where you map the properties, your Java properties, to the actual uh, database column names. And then you tell it how to go fetch that stuff with a SQL statement like that. So we built a little groovy script to generate this stuff for us. And this is what it looked like. Uh, this is just using low-level JDBC stuff in Java. You know, you can call any Java class from the groovy world, the, the, the scripting language version of Java, and, uh, but it's uh, dynamically typed. So we uh, created some variables and that sort of stuff. We go in here, and uh, this is how we harvested the column names. You go through and get a connection and create statement and execute query. Now, we were doing this against an ancient version of Sybase, and there was no direct way to query the metadata. But we discovered that if you do a select star from the table where 1 equals 0, it gives you an empty result set back populated with metadata. So we had to go on a little adventure to find that stuff. But we found that stuff out. And now we're just building a list, which is basically a hash. Uh, after we get the metadata, we build up a hash of the, the, uh, the type and the column name, because the database has all that stuff. And now this is how we create the mapping file. And the reason we chose Groovy to do this is because it has this really cool XML builder thing in it. And this is the, the XML builder stuff, which basically you just type code in the structure that you want your XML to have, and it'll spit it out as an XML document with that exact same structure. So we wanted a, an XML file that had SQL map as its root element, and it had an attribute namespace called event. And then there's a type alias thing inside it, and it had a couple of attributes. And uh, this is the part where we actually iterate over the hash that we have of the types and the column names to build up the, uh, the property name and the, uh, the column name. And then here at the end, we actually just write that thing out. And what we end up with is this guy. This is exactly what we wanted. But it's all dynamically built now as part of our build process. So that's half of our duplication problem. The other half was the class, the plain Java object, so we attacked it as well. So we built another little piece of Groovy called a class builder that basically takes in what imports do you want, the fields, the file name, the package name, and we set internal values for all those guys. This writes out the imports, and it was the same imports all the time, so that was just a static list of imports. This writes out the class name by figuring out, based on the table name, what the class name should be. And it writes out public class at the top of the file. To write out all the fields, we write out the type and the name of the field. And what you get after you run this little part of the code is public class event. And then there are all the, the types and the, uh, the field names. And then we wrote out the properties. We generated getter setter properties for them. One of the nice things about Groovy is that you can embed uh, variable values inside strings. So we didn't have to do any kind of clumsy concatenation or anything like that. So that actually writes out a getter, and that writes out a setter. And if you've done that, you've got something that looks like a regular get set pair. 
And then finally, we had all the building blocks. This is the last piece where we write out the package name and then write the import name, the fields, the properties, and then close it off with a final closed curly brace. And what we end up with is a plain Java object, basically just a DTO that is exactly the same structure as what is in the database and also matches exactly the XML configuration file that iBatis requires. So what we managed to do was, with a little bit of effort, make this, the database, the canonical representation, and generate the other two pieces. Now, it's a little more complicated in Hibernate. You don't actually have to have the SQL uh, stuff, uh, the SQL statement, et cetera, but there are tools like xdoclet, which basically in the Hibernate world, you can let your XML configuration file be the canonical source, and xdoclet can produce the DDL and the Java class for you from that single source. Here's another problem we ran into on one of our projects. This was a distributed project where there were some developers in Chicago, some in New York, and some in Bangalore. And we were all sharing the same version control and we were sharing the same uh, cruise control instance. The problem is that Bangalore is 10 and a half hours time difference from Chicago. Yes, Bangalore is in fact on a half hour time zone, which is just all the more annoying when you're trying to figure out meeting times and that sort of stuff. And we were all sharing <coughs> excuse me, the same code base, and so it was really important that when you finished work in Chicago at the end of the day, that you document what you did because the people in India may need to know that. And the same for them, when they finish their day, they need to document what they did. So we set up a wiki to do this, and we created a rule on the project that at the end of the day, go into the wiki and put in there what you did today. How well do you think that worked? Excellent. It worked great for about a week. And then people started saying, oh, no, I've got to catch a train, you know, I'll do that later, or would you put that in for me? And, but we realized this is fundamentally a dry problem because everybody was already putting in their subversion comments what they were working on. And so we wired this up. In our subversion repository, you can create a little hook. And we created a hook called SVN to wiki. And what it did was every time you checked in subversion, it harvested your comment for subversion and automatically posted it on a dated wiki page. The wiki we were using supported RSS feeds for updates. We installed an RSS reader on each one of the developer workstations, which means that when you come to work the next day, you get headlines of all the things that happened in the code base since you touched it the last time, which is really nice. You can get the same view out of the subversion log, but it's kind of tedious to have to go through the subversion log. Having it in this headline view where you know, an RSS reader, once you've read one of them, it marks it as read, and you can move on to the next one and just see the ones you haven't read yet. That became so useful that even our project manager started subscribing to that RSS feed just to kind of see how the flow of the project was going. And at the end of this project, we exported that wiki to just static HTML, best documentation ever. Because it described every single check-in that we did on a dated page, which is searchable, because it's all in HTML, to find out what happened in this code base. You could almost take that and recreate the project just from the documentation. And that's really useful developer documentation, not the kind that we usually have to create, which is in some sort of moldy Word doc somewhere of stuff that's out of date and doesn't really pertain to the actual project you're working on anymore. <coughs> okay, my last principle here is automation. And there are a bunch of obvious automatables in the developer world. Things one command build. I consider a project broken if I can't come to that project and do one checkout and then issue one command and build the whole thing. Because this is arguably the most important thing you do on a project is build it. You should have that automated to a degree where you just have to issue one command and have the entire thing kick off and work. 